Funders Forum virtual charrette. I'm Sean McManus, the co-founder of the Arts Funders Forum and co-founder of M plus D. We've had almost a, a thousand people from across the world register for these virtual events. And we are so grateful for you to be able to join us today. As most of you know, Arts Funders Forum is a new platform designed to shape the future of cultural philanthropy. And today's conversation really strikes at the core of our mission. We launched AFF because we realized that younger philanthropists were not engaging with the arts like previous generations. But today's speakers represent the exceptions to that rule. These are the voices of a new generation, those who are reinventing philanthropic models, responding to the crisis we are in with bold action, and shaping the future of arts funding for generations to come. As you know, many of the trends in arts funding, such as art for social justice, driving economic impact, leveraging technology, and creating new philanthropic and institutional partnerships were well underway before the pandemic, but they have now taken on a new urgency. We must work together as a community to remake the model for arts philanthropy that will enable the cultural sector to radically reinvent itself and come out even stronger on the other side. AFF is committed to continuing our in-depth research programs, facilitating new partnerships, convening events like this one, and advancing digital storytelling to create new narratives about the value of arts in society, which in a moment like we are in now could not be more relevant. Two weeks ago, we hosted a conversation with leaders at the intersection of culture and technology who are developing new ways for artists and institutions to connect with funding and new ways for all of us to connect more deeply with art and with artists. Today, we have assembled a community of leaders who will explore the goals, behaviors, and mindsets of the next generation of philanthropists. This is the demographic that will rewrite the rules of giving for the next decade and beyond, and it is vital that we understand how to bring these ideas into the collective consciousness of the cultural sector. Just today, a headline in Bloomberg announced that the two presidential candidates have embraced Snapchat as a way to connect with Gen Z audiences. So if President Trump and Joe Biden can do it, we are hopeful that the cultural community can find a way to do it as well. We will explore this topic in more depth during today's conversation. I wanna thank our co-host for today's charrette, Sarah Arison, who as many of you know, is president of the Arison Arts Foundation and board chair of the National Young Arts Foundation. Sarah has been a strong supporter of Arts Funders Forum since the beginning, and we are especially excited to hear more from her today about the COVID-19 Artist Relief Fund, which is an example of how new models of philanthropy can emerge quickly during a time of crisis if we all work together. Also, thank you to the M plus D team, including Samantha Keel, Kinga Christian, and Larissa Shulman for setting up today's virtual charrette. And special thanks to Jennifer Joy and her team at Sutton for being such great partners of ours in helping amplify the work of AFF and building our community. Thank you all again for joining us today and for your ongoing engagement with AFF and the Remake the Model series. I know this will be a very inspiring conversation and one that will lead to real outcomes to help guide the future of arts funding. Now I'm delighted to introduce my colleague to help lead the discussion, the Director of the Arts Funders Forum, Melissa Cowley-Wolf. There we go. Thank you, Sean, and thank you to everyone today. And also my thanks to the M plus D and Sutton teams and our fantastic speakers um, I'll introduce in a moment. Um, as Sean mentioned, we at AFF see this as a moment to shake things up and re-envision the systems of private arts funding, um, hence the title Remake the Model. Uh, many of us here today believed that this sector was experiencing a crisis before COVID. So now it's even more crucial to examine how to best engage next generation audiences and supporters moving forward. Um, a little context, uh, this crisis is occurring as we are experiencing the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth in the history of this country. But simultaneously giving to the arts has been decreasing as overall charitable giving has been rising. And those inheriting the wealth do not rank arts and culture giving as a priority. So we really wanna get to know this generation um, AFF research shows that younger philanthropists view giving as more process driven than transaction driven in contrast with the current older uh, donor class, meaning they care about how they give, not just what they give. 
Uh, we know that next-gen donors value issues more than they do organizations. They value the impact of giving more than their predecessors did. They believe in institutional transparency and effectiveness. They want to make systemic change, uh, roll up the sleeves, participate in change making, focused on local issues and ethical investing. And they want clarity on what they are funding, what they are impacting, and they move a lot faster than previous generations in all this work. So this discussion is valuable as we consider how to shape these new funding systems for this new era that we're in. Um, so a few notes on the series and today's discussion in particular. We call this a charrette because a charrette is by definition, um, it aims to resolve problems and map solutions. So our aim for this series is for it to be a whiteboard session, series of whiteboard sessions where the community, community together develops actual solutions to the challenges facing us right now and determines how we can best implement those solutions. So we want this to be as participatory as possible. Um, thank you to those that have already submitted some questions during the registration process. And if you want to submit questions for the speakers today, you can um, enter those in the Q&A box and use the chat box to make comments. Um, as Sean mentioned, we'll be exploring more topics um, in this series uh, coming up. So we ask that for today, um, everyone keep their questions related to the topic of next generation arts funding. So with that behind us, I'm excited to introduce our community of speakers who are role models for this next generation of art supporters. Thank you again to Sarah uh, Arison, our host. Um, I also wanna introduce Jamie Mayer, who is the chair of the Nathan Cummings Foundation. And this is the first time that a fourth generation Cummings family member has run the foundation's board. And Jamie also brings her experience as a managing director of performing arts nonprofits. Larry Milstein is an entrepreneur and co-founder of PRISM, where he advises nonprofit clients and Fortune 100 companies on next generation engagement. And Larry recently hosted Zoomtopia, Zoom's first ever charity gala, uh, gala which raised funds for COVID-19 response relief efforts. And Victoria Rogers, a creative business strategist, collector, and member of the Brooklyn Museum, where she's one of the youngest trustees on the board, Creative Time, and also the Global Council for the Studio Museum in Harlem. So welcome you all. Thank you for being here. Um, we're going to start out by asking each of the speakers um, questions um, to open up in two minutes or less to let us know what you're working on and what challenges and opportunities you would like to explore with the AFF community today related to next gen funding behaviors. So thinking about how our community could help and especially during this crisis. So we'll start um, today with Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's great to see you. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation hearing about all the great work everybody's doing. Um, when it became apparent that you know COVID was truly a disaster for the world, um, a, the um, executive and artistic director of the Center for Art and Performance at UCLA, Christy Edmonds, who's also a Young Arts Board member, was on the phone with the um, president and CEO of United States artist, Dina Hagag. And um, Christy, who is has been a mentor for me for many years, um, said, you know, you have to do something and you have to do something now. This can't wait. Um, the need is going to be immediate. And so then Dean and I started talking and I started speaking with senior staff of Young Arts. And, you know, we realized that the artistic community is one of the most vulnerable. You know, these are gig workers. They might not have health insurance in many cases. They might not have savings to last very long. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, everything for artists is really based on experience and public interaction, whether it's a gallery open, opening, a book reading, a performance, um, you know, whatever it is, it's all about the engagement with the public and their work. And they're, you know, with everything happening with COVID, there was no longer a chance for that. Um, and so we created a coalition um, between Young Arts, United States Artists, and five other organizations um, called Artist Relief Fund. Um, and I'll post the link to that in the chat after this. Um, but basically we knew that any relief um, was probably not going to come fast enough. Uh, and so we figured out in three weeks, um, we raised $10 million. <laughs> and immediately started deploying $5,000 unrestricted grants. 
And I think one of the key parts about Artist Relief Fund is that there is no expectation for these artists to create work with this. This is for basic human necessities. This is food, this is shelter, this is you know, for children, for medical care, um, because these people's lives are at stake. And so um, we, to date, so it launched April 8th, and to date we have received nearly 75,000 applications, which, you know, it was, there was this moment, you know, the day we launched, um, there was this kind of moment of cognitive dissonance because we were all, you know, on cloud nine, oh my gosh, we raised $10 million, you know, we did it, we're launching this fund. And then we got over 10,000 applications in the first day and the system crashed. And so we went from this feeling of, you know, joy and accomplishment of, oh, we're going to be able to do so much good to, oh my God, the amount of need out there is astonishingly heartbreaking. Um, and, you know, the, the stories of the applications, it's, you know, people with diabetes who can't afford medicine. It's, you know, a performer who's having her first child in two weeks and her husband's also, you know, in the performing arts. And so they have a baby coming in absolutely no source of income. Um, so, you know, it, it has really been um, kind of heartbreaking seeing the impact that this has had on, on artists in the community. So we, um, 75 applications, 75,000 applications so far, we have given out $655,000 grants um, with another hundred to go out tomorrow. And then in conjunction with this, we kind of felt that since we were going to be engaging with artists from all over the country, every different discipline that you can imagine, um, it was actually an opportunity to start capturing information about the artistic community. So we launched a survey with Americans for the Arts in conjunction with this, and we've, um, we've gotten about 15,000 responses. And it's about income and savings and needs. And so while it's very important to know about this now during COVID, I, I think and hope that we will all be able um, to use this information to go into the future to help support the community in better ways. Great, Sarah, thank you so much. And congratulations on getting that together so fast. I know there'll be a lot of questions and we'll go back to that. So thank you. Um, let's move to Jamie next. You know, I've gone down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out what arts funding looked like in 1918 after the Spanish flu outbreak. And the, the best I could find is that the arts were mostly funded at a local level. There was a great sense of community back then that we rarely find nowadays. So one of my big questions is how do we use culture to create a sense of community and belonging again? We're in the business of changing hearts and minds. Uh, a friend of mine likes to say we are hope dealers and purveyors of radical imagination, which I love. Um, and it's really a, a values proposition at the end of the day. So many artists are without an artistic home and under supported, not just because of the impact of coronavirus, but generally as culture leaders. It seems that this moment is just shining a light on what has always been there. I mean, obviously arts institutions are vital, but when the going gets tough, as was alluded to earlier, they put their staff first, not their gig workers or their artists. There's no net for artists because they're self-employed. So let's think deeply about what we're longing to return to as a field. We need to give artistic homes and actually mean it. What is next is a choice and each choice we make today designs our world for tomorrow. How do we not just rebuild, but reinvent and redesign a system that places the artist at the center and supports them and their work above all else? Who claims individual artists? Sarah was talking about the amazing artist relief fund earlier, which is truly incredible and a game changer. And thank you, Sarah. But how can we all be inspired by this to rethink funding in the arts? We need to look at a full system change and overhaul. And that's something that next gen funders can really get behind, rolling up our sleeves and helping to create a solution and a future. We don't do well when asked to just write checks and follow in the footsteps of our parents and grandparents as patrons and donors. We prefer to contribute fully, to use our time, talent, treasure, and ties to help organizations. We like to feel a sense of ownership and pride over the causes we care about, and that makes us great ambassadors. It encourages us to give from a place of true interest and caring, not just out of obligation. When asked about the arts, members of the next gen often reference a high barrier to entry as a deterrent. We're living in a moment where there is literally no barrier to entry to access the arts online. It's up to us to keep the arts front and center in this moment. 
to shine the light on it that those of us on this call know has always been there. The system has been broken for quite some time. Let's not let what we learn from this crisis go to waste. Jamie, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we'll turn to Larry next. Larry, welcome. Thank you for having me, um, AFF and Sarah, for organizing this. Um, I think that as we're all sharing in the necessity to take bold action is even more paramount in the circumstances that we're in. And one of the goals coming out of Zoomtopia that we briefly talked about obviously was to you know, provide immediate relief for COVID you know, efforts, but more importantly, it was also to be a proof of concept and offer a model in which other organizations that you know, had their events and galas and programming um, planned well through the spring and the summer and had to quickly pivot could look to as a meaningful way in which they can kind of take the best practices and fit it for their needs as well. And coming out of the success of that, um, I've been fielding a lot of kind of inquiries and frankly, just people looking for advice saying, hey, we have a community that's eager to support us. We're not able to bring them together in person. What are ways in which we can activate virtually and explore innovative models in which we can bring people together and really cultivate that community, but also raise critical lifeblood for these institutions to not just you know, survive this period, but in some ways actually come out stronger from it. So that's kind of on more of a personal philanthropic side, but with my ear through kind of the prism professional lens where I'm working and collaborating with Gen Zers every day. I think what's been really fascinating is thinking about who are the future artists, who are the future emerging creatives that we need to make sure are, you know, supported at this time as well. Um, Gen Zers, you know, this is like the post-millennial demographic. They're displaced from college. They have seen, you know, they were entering a job market that was the strongest in 50 years and now have seen all those opportunities dry up. And so what does it look like to take, you know, creatives and future artists and, you know, the future funders of the arts and make sure that there's opportunities for connection and engagement. And so we launched an initiative called Prism People, where we're functionally doing that, finding ways for Gen Zers to connect with one another, connect to paying projects that are really tapping into their insight and their perspective, um, and then really, you know, facilitating that exchange of information so that organizations, nonprofits, and brands can learn and, you know, fully um, kind of capture that type of valuable insight. Um, so I think it's a really 360 effort and I'm excited to hopefully be part of making those positive changes. Larry, thank you so much. Uh, Victoria. Hi, thank you. All thank you Arts Funders Forum for everyone who's here listening and Sarah for putting together this great group. I'm really excited to be here um, and learn from all of you. Um, as Melissa mentioned, I'm on the boards of Creative Time and also the Brooklyn Museum and at both organizations, I've been a part of teams thinking through the impact of this pandemic um, and how best we can prepare for what our new version of normal will be because we know it will be different from the world that we were in just a few months ago. An obvious challenge to me is the incredible deal of uncertainty we're facing. Um, everyone knows this, I think, but having no sense of when this will end is something that creates a huge amount of anxiety. And in particular, as I think about the organizations I'm a part of, especially because they're largely anchored in New York City, I believe we have this real responsibility to be responsive to what our communities are feeling. And without a sense of timeline, I think moving through the grievance process, the acceptance process, the rebuilding process, is really difficult for any one individual and also difficult for institutions to be responsive to. On the other side, I think there's also this opportunity to expand outwards beyond our existing communities, um, to find like-minded collaborators across the globe to support one another. Um, and I've been thinking also a lot about the ways in which physical space can develop reach beyond it. 
even beyond virtual, like what other tools are there that we can use as a means of connection? And if we don't find any that are satisfactory, should we be building them? Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing the perspectives of this group on that. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, and all of you for getting us started. There's a lot to work with here. Um, something that's come up in um, several of what uh, several people said today was um, technology. And I think, you know, our, as Sean said, our first panel was on technology and knowing who the audience and the users are. We know that this is the best tool we have to engage new audiences and next gen. So I wanted to start uh, with a question uh, for, for Larry about technology. Picking up on what you said about how do you see technology driving entirely new ways of funding for the arts? And as you said, how can we best activate this community virtually, especially right now as the need is greater than ever? I think what's fascinating about the role of technology at this time is that it's created this burning platform in some ways where institutions that you know, always had this in the pipeline, have now had to really contend with the fact that this is not something that can be put off that we needed to lean into. Um, and so I think the operative way to engage it is to think about how can technology be an enabler of connection and not just a band-aid solution or kind of a diluted version of what you would be trying to just do physically? Like what is the actual value add by utilizing these tools? And so I think, you know, we have obviously had opportunities to see some organizations translate some of their programming and performances online. Um, and I think that's in some ways even more valuable or in some ways a totally different type of value offering because it's a democratizing force. People that may not have been able to see performances live, you're now able to broadcast to hundreds of thousands of people. So what does that model of fundraising look like when you're not just targeting the capacity for a theater, but you're thinking even larger? Um, I think secondarily, I've been so excited to see organizations be willing to explore next-gen platforms like TikTok. Like, I'm not sure how many, I'm sure many organizations tuning in right now have Instagram presences and they're well-developed, but um, I recently was speaking with a performing arts organization who's like, we have all these talented people who are going famous on TikTok, but we haven't really captured our own audience through that. How do we do that? And so I think that's another kind of, from a social media standpoint, a new frontier that's really been completely opened in this um, kind of COVID environment. And then I think finally, to Victoria's point is, what are these even future looking technologies looking like? One of our clients is creating 3D virtual worlds. I'm speaking to an artist now who's like, I am so sick of seeing, you know, this sterile um, environment in which art is being displayed for various things. It feels very single dimensional. This is the time for me to explore transposing my art into an entirely 3D VR environment. Help me do that. Um, and so it's exciting to see this be the impetus in which people are taking bold action. That's great. Um, other panelists, Victoria, Sarah, Jamie, thoughts uh, with uh, regards to what Larry said about how, especially how organizations right now can utilize technology specifically to attract next generation donors. Yeah, I'll jump on that. I'm vice chair of a nonprofit called ASTEP, Artists Striving to End Poverty. And for years, we've talked about how we have much broader appeal than what we're able to reach in terms of, um, of our donor base. And we kind of an act of serendipity put together Sondheim's 90th birthday concert two weeks ago. And for an organization whose annual operating budget is a million dollars and had a $50,000 goal for this benefit that we pulled together, we raised over half a million dollars and had over 2 million views um, in less than two weeks, which is insane um, and never would have happened if this moment in time hadn't happened. I mean, it's a little bit of a silver lining and obviously Sondheim doesn't turn 90 every day. Uh, so a bit of a, an outlier there, but a great example of, of the true reach that you can really have in this moment. I think if we're... Oh. Go ahead. 
Um, I think if we're talking about technology, um, on one hand, it can be democratizing as far as, as, far as access um, to the arts, but I think we also need to have the discussion about um, technology and education right now. And, you know, recognize the fact that I think a lot of students who may already be at a disadvantage in classrooms um, now are expected to learn at home. And they may not have regular access to Wi-Fi. They may not have access to computers or smartphones regularly. And so a place where they are already at a disadvantage and there's already a divide is becoming far greater as everything is going online and they are going to be left behind even more. Um, and in thinking about issues like that, um, I think it really makes us take a look at the purpose of institutions and you know, rather than a culture institution, you know, presenting work or acquiring work, um, it, it needs to be thought of more as a place to serve families, communities, and help where uh, some of these students might be falling behind in education. Um, you know, this is something I'm also on the board of the Brooklyn Museum, and this is something that we talk about a lot because the community that we're in is one of the most affected um, in the country by this, and. And so I think the, the discussion of technology, while it is amazing because, you know, um, I'm on the board of American Ballet Theater and we had our 80th anniversary gala, gala last night. And, you know, what, what would probably have been, you know, a few hundred people in person at, at David Koch Theater was 11,000 people. So, and, and it was a great program and it, you know, featured the dancers and the history. Um, so on one hand, there is that, that benefit and that access, but I think we also need to think about those who don't have the access to, te to technology and how that divide um, is now becoming even greater. Thank you. Mm. Victoria. Yeah, and I was just going to add that I think technology could also be looked at outside of just like virtual access. And I, I'm really excited about the ways in which new technologies can come into physical spaces as a means of protecting, shielding us, creating clear pathways of how you can move through a space while six feet away. I think that um, there's this sort of something I love about the art world and the cultural field is that it is historic where you enter into buildings that have been there for decades, for centuries, and there is something really magical about that. I also think that there's work that could be done around creating experiences that are specific to the people who are ent entering into those places. And so having an open conversation around how technology can be of use to us when it's sort of necessitated because of the crisis, but also using that to create sort of a personalized version of what it might look like to go into a space is exciting to me. Um, I think just being open to the conversation of how technology can, can influence the way we move through space, whether it's on our own, in our own spaces or within an institution is important to remember too. Thank you. I wanna pivot a bit um, and I wanna direct a question to Jamie. Um, the Nathan Cummings Foundation is focused on social justice. So it touches a, a lot of different sectors with your funding. Um, and because of your role with that organization and others and your background in arts and culture, I wanted to ask you how you think cultural philanthropy differs from philanthropy in the other sectors. And you know what makes cultural philanthropy unique, but also what could we learn from other sectors, especially in terms of um, measuring impact? Way to lump a bunch of questions together there, Melissa. <laughs> I, 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 I thought I'd do that for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, impact and metrics, right, are are really what set us apart. But um, as in how difficult it is <laughs> for us to um, to measure impact and to obtain metrics that are that are meaningful. Um, but I think what we can what we can really learn from other sectors that are out there is that it's the long game. I believe in cultural philanthropy, we often look at one exhibit or um, one production or, or whatever it might be in a short term kind of one-off way and rarely look at 
in an, an artist for their entire body of work um, and supporting them over the course of their entire career, uh, more like a blip um, along the along the timeline and and figuring out the way that we support organizations in other spaces, how we can look at um, look at artists and look at the arts institutions that are not what we truly think of as brick and mortar in a museum way or ABT, which Sarah just mentioned, um, or the fill or any of the, you know, the kind of big guys uh, who tend to get annual funding year after year, how we can, how we can make sure that organizations and artists can really exist and thrive. Um, that would be my biggest piece. And then, and then I would say that, um, that money is a barrier in the cultural space in a way that I feel it isn't in others um, and in cultural philanthropy. It's a, it's, a, it's a branding question of how we can really brand ourselves as a sector so that people understand what we're doing and respect what we're doing and understand why why what we're doing deserves the the money and the funds both as an audience member and as a donor um and and to me that's the biggest piece of education that's missing that we we have innately for climate and for um for so many other for health for you know other areas that are out there for religion for cures um and, and so that's what I would highlight in terms of the metrics piece. I'm probably not the best person um, on this call to answer this question. If you want to punt that to somebody else, uh, I'm happy to wax poetic, but it's probably not the best use of everyone's time. <laughs> that's why everyone's here. I'll turn this around to the group as a whole, because I think you touched upon a lot of different things, Jamie, and thank you. You know, one of the things you said is, um, uh, playing the long game and why that's so important. And one of the ways we can play the long game is to determine how the cultural sector can create and advance new narratives specifically aimed at next gen donors through storytelling that will enable a more widespread interest among next gen donors for the arts. So before we open up to audience questions which Sean has been queuing for us, I wanted to put that out to the panel because it's something that has come up a lot in our work and in the conversations we're having now is we have this moment where we have the attention um, of the global community around the arts. People are turning to the arts like never before. And we have a moment to engage next end donors. So I wanted to ask you all, um, you know, what you think the most compelling narratives could be specifically uh, towards next end donors to recruit them into arts, uh, the art sectors, audiences and donors. So let's start with Larry. Put you awesome. on the spot. I mean, I think, no, that's totally fine. I think, Melissa, what you said earlier was really compelling, which is what does it mean for next gen audiences to, for whatever reason to prioritize other issues beyond the arts? And I think what is quite compelling is this idea of how can we kind of shed this image of the arts being in this like ivory tower, cultural institutions being inaccessible, but actually have them in direct dialogue with the issues that are most, you know, seen as pressing in the eyes of next gen audiences. Um, I know among Gen Z audiences that like climate crisis is like the top issue, especially in light of the environment we're living in, because this is the world that we're going to be inheriting and going to be contending against the ills of. And so organizations have done some incredible work expressing how their work is intersectional and how those narratives are not just, you know, in isolation of these um, very pressing social issues, but are actually directly um, either amplifying them or in dialogue and kind of contesting them. And so I guess to distill that down into like a guidance on like what would be like the story to share it is like the more you can have it weaved into the issues that are not actually abstracted from the topics and the art and the creative expression on display, that's how you're going to continue to garner the attention of our generation. Thank you. Victoria? Sure. Um, I agree with Larry and Jamie wholeheartedly. I think two just additional notes. I think 
it's really, we can see that the arts reflect our world and that cultural institutions are actively engaged with community. I think about the work that Creative Time has done for decades um, to, to draw out some of the most pressing social issues of our time and be boldly at the forefront of discussing them. And I think that kind of bold action is something that people in our generation can get behind and understand. Um, and I agree with you, Larry, that the ivory tower narrative is just less compelling. Um, I think that's important. I think the last thing too is in terms of amount of giving, there is this narrative that to be a supporter of the arts, you have to be able to give a lot of money. Um, and I think that whatever we can do to dismantle that narrative um, is really helpful because building behaviors early on, um, when people are just beginning to think about how they can be philanthropic, I think building those behaviors early on um, just helps ensure that relationships are there, that trust is there, that people are learning early on how to be philanthropists in a way that's sustainable, responsible, um, and you actually don't need that much money to do it. And so I think at Kickstarter, where I was before um, going to business school, our minimum donation was $5. And I think giving that as an access point was something that just changed the way people thought about whether or not they could be cultural philanthropists. And I think little efforts like that can go a long way. That's great, thank you. And it's true, It's we know philanthropy is habit forming and it's crucial to start that process early and you are all role models for that. Um, Sarah, before we open up for audience questions, wanted to turn with, to you to talk about some ideas for new narratives that could um, compel next gen donors to get involved with the arts. Yeah, um, you know, to piggyback a little bit on what Victoria is saying, I think exposure is key. Um, you know, I, growing up, I was actually like, on math team and thought I was going to be pre-med and, you know, was, was not somebody who thought of myself as passionate about the arts, but my grandparents, every interaction with them ever had something to do with some art form, whether we were going to the ballet or the symphony. And so growing up with that, it just became a part of my life in a way that I don't think I recognized what an impact that had until, you know, decades later. Um, so I think exposure is really important. Um, you know, when, <laughs> So often, you know, when I'm fundraising for one organization or another, you know, you get the, well, if you want to support the arts, like go buy a ticket to a Broadway show response, um, which makes me crazy. And, you know, then the response is look at absolutely everything in your life. Um, the house that you're living in was designed by an architect. The book that you're reading is a writer. The television show that you're watching is a script writer and an actor and a director and a cinematographer. Um, if you think about it, there is genuinely no aspect of your life that's not touched by an artist. And particularly in this time, like, can you all imagine quarantining without books, movies, <laughs> music? I mean, any, you know, television shows and none of those would exist without artists. So I think just that perspective and looking at it and then, I'm, you know, you can even think of chefs as artists. Like when you really think of an art, the ecology of the artistic community, um, it's vast and our lives would be horrible without it. Um, and so coming out of this, I think, you know, one of the things that I would like to see happen is um, there was this famous study a number of years ago um, that where 96% of people survey said they supported the arts and I think like 25 said they supported artists. And so, you know, that not recognizing the importance of artists at the base of everything um, is something that I really hope to change. Um, and then, you know, I think also looking at collaboration, and I think we are all very interested in and passionate about collaboration. And in pulling together the Artist Relief Fund, you know, for me, that was the biggest argument I can think of for collaboration. Because if one of us had, if one organization had tried to do that, there would be no way that we would be able to, you know, raise ten thousand dollars, go through seventy-five thousand applications. Um, it was a genuinely collaborative process where there was a lot of trust, um, definitely some risk, um, and everybody came kind of with no ego um, and the same mission, and using the, their strengths. Um, to to really work together to achieve this goal. Um, you know, I'm the 
chair of the board of the National Young Arts Foundation, and we identify and support the greatest young artists across disciplines in the country. And our first touch point with them is when they're in high school, 15 to 18. And we really aim to provide a lifetime of support. Um, and, you know, rather than, we've decided that kind of rather than us take on the onus of trying to support them at every critical juncture in their education and career, let's look and see what are the organizations um, that are doing it well at those points and have been doing it for a long time and have that expertise. So we may kind of find them and have our first, first touch point with them at 15 to 18 and be really critical um, at that juncture be, from high school to college. But you know, then we one of our partners is Sundance Ignite that has filmmakers um, 18 to 25. And so we basically like take our filmmakers that we find in high school and feed them onto Sundance. And so it creates this community that provides a lifetime of support. And you know, there's so much competition out there for programming and for fundraising that I think if organizations thought more collaboratively about this is my strength, I've been doing it really well for 30 years. Um, I know this is what you're doing and that can be another moment. I think that for me is something that's really interesting. And I think, you know, everybody in our generation and others, you know, quite frankly, I don't think we need to speak of it generationally. Um, in thinking that way, we could really do a lot more especially as I think we're heading into a time when resources, which were already quite scarce, are gonna become even scarcer. Amen to everything that was said. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm gonna to turn to Sean, who's been compiling what I know is are a lot of audience questions and our chat box has been lighting up. So Sean, you wanna uh, start us off with a question from the audience, please. Yeah, we have a bunch of great questions flooding in from the community. We have um, over 300 people on the on the call today, so very excited to um, to have this uh, this going this much engagement. So back to Sarah, actually. So Sarah, um, a lot of questions are coming in about partnerships and collaborations, um, and you just mentioned the incredible consortium that you put together for the Artist Relief Fund. I mean, if you look at the list, right, and you've mentioned some of them, you've got artist foundations like Andy. Warhol, Robert Rauschenberg, Willem De, uh, the de Kooning Foundation, you've got MAP Fund, you've got um, obviously Young Arts, you've got Creative Capital, you've got the Academy of American Poets uh, who are involved in this coalition. So tell us a little bit, our, one of our central theses at AFF is the notion that the next generation of funders can really think um, more creatively and innovatively about how to approach partnerships and the notion that they're not necessarily as bound to kind of more rigid structures of, of partnerships and, and who can basically play in the sandbox together. Can you give us a little insight into how that consortium came together? What are some of the mechanics of how all that worked? Uh, it, I mean, speed dialing everyone in the Rolodex to sort of to, to see who floods in or what, how did it work? No, you know, I think um, there's there, a lot of people there, there were all people who have kind of known each other, known each other's organizations and work for a number of years. And there had always been this, you know, you're amazing and I love what you do and I would love to do something together, but I don't know what it is yet. And, and this, when, when this, we kind of started talking about this, um, it was just that of, you know, we need, so the, um, the Foundation for Contemporary Arts was one of the, the seven organizations that worked to put it together. They have experience doing emergency grants. Um, so, you know, that that's something there, you know, with Young Arts, we are, um, as well as with United States artists, we're both across all, all artistic disciplines. So that was something that we, you know, we felt was really important as well as um, totally geographically diverse. So, you know, in looking, we, we really looked at, you know, again, because this was done so quickly, um, there was a lot of legal and a lot of financial risk to this. Um, so there was a leap of faith for kind of everybody involved, um, but I think that was possible because these are people who, you know, we've seen them work for so many years and, you know, we know their mission is pure and we, and then again, looking at every, what can everybody bring as different strengths. Um, Young Arts had the platform that they, we do micro grants for our alumni. Um, and so we, we could kind of take that and adapt it and help create the platform for this. So it was, what are the different components that we need? Um, but also who are the people that we trust um, that we know have the same mission and ethos that we Wonderful. And I think, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the message here is about, you know, um, 
you know, calling on your friends and those you trust and um, at the same time thinking expansively about uh, who can be part of coalitions um, that you might not normally think of. And I know one of the takeaways from last, uh, the last conversation was the notion that social impact is obviously uh, something foundations across uh, different philanthropic sectors are working on. And it's something that um, art philanthropy needs to think more about how to tap into those relationships as well. So thank you for that detail. And um, you know, I think that's really helpful for people to understand how the mechanics uh, of, of those kinds of real-time models are working. Um, this is a question that can go, that was inspired um, by a question to Jamie. And also I think Larry is someone who can respond to this, but, but Jamie, you talked about the rethinking the question of space, right? The notion that technology is not only broadening the base of engagement, but also really allowing us to think differently about the notion of artistic spaces. Um, one of our audience members asks if you can expand on that notion. And then I think what we'd like to hear from Larry on is, as you're thinking about, for example, putting AR, VR to use in, um, in the uh, service of clients that are thinking about creating new artistic experiences, um, how does that uh, play a role in what may become the future of artistic engagement after this crisis? Uh, Jamie? Yeah, actually, Victoria, do you want this since you were talking about the, the different spaces earlier? That'd be, that'd be great. Sure, the question is around how technology could be used to create new experiences for people inside of physical spaces from my comment earlier. Yes, please. Yeah, so I think to me, what seems most exciting is having, um, is, is like part, so there's a few different ways it could go. I think that Google's been doing some amazing work in partnering with arts organizations already and going behind the scenes, walking through them, um, to being able to level up and share what it looks like to go through an institution remotely. I think sort of the counter side of that that I was interested in exploring and hearing ideas from the group around is how do you bring technology into a physical space that already exists and use it to make someone's experience of it personalized, more responsive, and where they can leave kind of going, having been through the physical space in a way that was catered towards them. And so I don't have an idea of exactly how that happens, but I think something like um, Brooklyn Museum's ask a capability where you can text and get answers to questions is like the very beginning start of that idea. Um, and I'm excited about ways that that could be pushed forward, especially in this moment when people are bringing in new people to re-envision how you can occupy physical space post-COVID. Th thank you, uh, Victoria. So, so Larry, did you want to, um, did you that from kind of the technology perspective and some of the, some of the engagements you were talking about earlier? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what's exciting about this period um, as I said before, is that it's kind of a forcing mechanism for people to kind of challenge the boundaries of their own mediums. And so if you have an artist that has, you know, primarily used, you know, uh, painting on canvas, what are ways in which that can be translated into not just, you know, posting an image of their art, but actually embracing the very tenets of the technological platforms themselves. And so I think the VR 3D perspective is an exciting one because it's not, it's not a means to an end, but it's an end in them themselves. It's how are we going to be embracing tools that are in and of itself a new medium of expression. And I think that's a nuance that's often lost in those conversations. It's not a band-aid solution but something that's in and above itself. I think another kind of more specific example is I'm on the board of the Parish Art Museum and they had this incredible um, you know, exhibition of Clifford Ross's um, artwork transposed on the very wall of the Parish Art Museum. And that was back in 2017, so pre the environment we're living in. But it's a moment where you could be driving by in your car and you're experiencing art on a scale that's accessible, but in this environment also quite safe and responsible. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of questions around TikTok and like monetization there. And I'm happy to chat more about that, but the crux of it is exposure is power. 
And we can certainly kind of, I'm not an evangelizer of big tech, like I have no stock or stake in uh, any of these firms. But I think the point that I'm making is almost to Sarah's point is you need to give people that initial moment of, wow, I would not have seen that otherwise. And now I care about this. And this had an emotional impact on me that otherwise it wouldn't come across my radar. And if you're garnering thousands, or in many cases, these platforms, millions of views for institutions to control that narrative, that is power as well as you're fundraising and you're seeking um, brands and, org and corporations to sponsor you. When you have eyeballs, that translates into dollars. So it actually is a viable revenue model and something that I think organizations should explore more actively. Thank you, Larry. Melissa, go ahead. Sure. We got some questions um, that were submitted with registration that had a lot to do with this issue of impact, because we do know that, um, you know, as one, one book and study was written of which Victoria was a part was called Generation Impact, and that next gen donors, uh, that is, that is the, what they value the most. So I want to touch back on something Sarah said, which is um, the study that showed that of all the people who were funding cult, arts and culture, weren't necessarily uh, providing direct artist support. And there was a disconnect between funding arts and culture as a sector and, fund and direct artist support. So given that we're in this moment where we have this compelling case of how people are turning to arts and culture like never before, the work of the artist as the gig worker is now um, resonating uh, better than it has before in our society. Um, at the same time, impact has been uh, traditionally harder to prove in the arts and culture sector. It's measured through attendance or ticket sales versus um, you know, the change of hearts and minds. That's a very hard thing to quantify. And a lot of people would agree that that is the result of, an, of a great artistic experience. So given everything we've talked about and that this is such a large issue, I wanted to um, ask each of you just to touch upon um, how using this moment, we can best articulate the impact of, of the arts and culture sector and artists on society, um, specifically aimed at next generation donors. So not necessarily the mechanism, but what's, what's the story there and how do we articulate that? So um, if we could start with Jamie, that would be great. Sure, uh, since you said th like this exact moment, I think we're in a unique moment where it's really easy to measure impact in the arts. Um, in the way that others want us to be measuring impact, not in the way that we necessarily would measure it ourselves in terms of the, the long game of hearts and minds, um, but in terms of conversion rates, right? And in terms of impressions and all of the, all of the pieces that other fields look at and think about in terms of metrics and in terms of impact. And, and I think, um, we'd be doing ourselves a disservice if we didn't look at this and see what we can learn from it as we hopefully somewhat in the near future move back to an in-person space and not a full Zoom and, and online world. Thank you. Uh, Victoria, thoughts, thoughts on that? I think the narrative and story is around the arts as a place of healing. Um, I think Sarah spoke really eloquently about all of the, the things that artists have created for us that people are turning to in this moment where they're broken and distraught um, and in pain and you know finding also though moments of community with others. Um, I think of um, the groups that I'm a part of that are reading books together for the first time or listening to the same album in a single day and then discussing it um, I think that we have a really incredible um, sort of power in this moment of being able to bring joy to people's lives. Um, though I, I think too, the arts is a place where people question what's happening in the world. It's also a place of celebration. And I think both of those things are needed right now. Um, and the creative community is uniquely positioned to be leading that dialogue. Thank you. Uh, Larry. Um, I think completely building off of Victoria, but I would also add this moment of when you're in this kind of seminal moment of pain and a complete paradigm shift of how the world is operating, that's oftentimes when we've seen the greatest 
contributions to the canon of art. I mean, I think there have been some amazing academic studies about like coming out of like the plague, like the huge impact that we had in, you know, art history across different mediums in architecture, how the 19, 19, 19 early 20th century uh, Spanish flu modernized the bathroom and how it impacted architecture. So I think when you're trying to quantify impact um, from the vantage point of an arts or creative organization is articulating something like that, which is like, do you wanna have a stake in what this kind of post COVID artistic contribution is going to look like? Like what better opportunity for you to really support that endeavor? And that feels like something even beyond hearts and minds because it's really about impact. It's, we have this moment where our perspective and voice is going to carry an even greater amount of you know, influence. And so let's not miss this opportunity to support that. Thank you. And Sarah, we'll turn to you next. Um, I don't have much to add. Um since everybody made such great points. Um, but you know, I think that recognizing now more than ever that artists shine a light on the world around us. Um, you know, they, they really are so incredibly talented at bringing, you know, whether it's social justice or the environment or, you know, any of these major issues um, that are so much of a part of our lives today, they present them in a unique and powerful way. Um, I think they're also, incredibly adept at building communities. Um, I think if you look at um, what Mark Bradford has done with, um, somebody help me, Art and Practice in LA, or what Fiastra Gates has done with Rebuild in Chicago, or what, um, you know, you see so many, uh, what Hank Willis Thomas has done with For Freedoms. You see so many examples of how artists, and by the way, those are all like, technically visually amazing artists on the side. At, they are also rebuilding communities, rebuilding people's lives, creating connections. Um, and it's, it's something that is, I think a talent of so many artists. And I think that they are going to be very key in rebuilding communities and lives as we're coming out of this. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all so much. Um, this was a great discussion and I think we've just sort of almost scratched the surface and could go on for much longer, but um, I want to uh, wrap it up. Thank you and turn it over to Sean to close us out for today. Thank wow. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Um, everyone in the audience, uh, we had so many good, good questions. Hopefully we touched on many of those in some way or another. And obviously those will all get posted um, after the fact when we have a link uh, to share. For this. Um, so I think we heard a lot of really interesting stuff today and I hope stuff that'll be quite actionable for our community um, to take back to their institutions, to the family offices that they're working on, to the investment social impact organizations that they're with um, and, we'll, and we'll hopefully employ some of these ideas um, where they work. Um, you know, we can't uh, obviously get away from the big issue of technology. Um, that was something that we spoke about two weeks ago in depth and something that came up a lot today. Um, you know, Sarah reminded us to really think about the educational components of that, um, especially as so many people are learning online and teaching online now more than ever before, um, literally everyone in the world. Um, however, not everyone has access to uh, that technology and we need to make sure that we build infrastructure um, for digital inclusion if we expect for technology to really have an impact in the arts. And that's something that we need to think about at the highest levels. Um, but we also, I think uh, our speakers today were sending the message that uh, artists and institutions need to adopt technology very quickly. And now's the moment to really think about that. And it's quite interesting that Silicon Valley has been saying the last couple of weeks that, you know, I know there was a tech lash and everyone kind of hated big tech, but you know, now we're here and we're kind of uh, providing a lot of important and basic services for the world. So it's an interesting tension and debate and something I think a lot of artists and institutions um, and also funders need to think about how, what is their sort of strategy and, and mindset around, around technology. Obviously, Larry represents someone who's working at the cutting edge of developing new <clears throat> innovative technologies for clients. And, and you know, there's a lot of learnings that can happen from across sectors um, in terms of bringing in the latest technology into the, art, into the arts to, to advance the mission of institutions. Um, we talked a lot about measuring impact today. Um, I, you know, a lot of our speakers really talked about 
um, the importance of narratives around impact. But you know, when you inf impact one artist who's making a real difference or advancing one institution that's making a real difference, um, sometimes it's economic impact on a city broadly, but sometimes it's, it's Who's, who's changing hearts and minds. And we need to tell the story of why that matters and why that does make a big impact. And uh, Victoria in particular said, you know, arts as healing, arts as a place of healing. And we're in a moment right now where the arts is functioning in that role. That's a major impact. We need to tell that story and make sure younger philanthropists are getting the message that this is playing a role, right? Jamie said, when it comes to philanthropy and its, and its connection to arts philanthropy, play the long game, right? We know that social impact investing has become such an important and integral part of investment generally across the world. Arts institutions, art funders, and philanthropists need to think about that way as well. So we need to think about laying the groundwork and playing the long game and making sure that the impacts we have are, are, are for the long term as well. Um, Larry again talked about social issues. We know that young philanthropists are driven by social impact, social justice. Cultural institutions need to tell the story of the impact they're having in the world and those narratives will shape that. Partnerships and collaborations again become such an important part of this story. As Sarah described the work with the Artist Relief Fund, it's, it's a consortium of friends and trust, um, uh, trusted partners. Um, it's also you know, new, new and innovative partners that you might not expect who come to the table in a moment of need as well. <clears throat> and we talked about uh, one, of the, one of the questions that we didn't really address head on, but how do we brand culture as a basic need? And I think that what we're seeing in a time of crisis um, during this pandemic is that the arts are a basic need. They are a, a, a source of healing. They are a source of education online and they are a source of bringing communities together um, and driving us forward. So I hope that that messaging can really be something that we expand on as a community um, and help and help to cultivate uh, that thinking among the broader um, the, among the broader world. So anyway, I hope all of this was helpful to everyone. I want to give such a big thanks to all of our speakers, Jamie, Victoria, Larry, and of course, Sarah Arison, our guest host for today. Thank you so much um, for your insights and for helping us put this together. Thanks again to the M plus D team. Thanks to Sutton, our partners, and of course, uh, Melissa Cowley-Wolf, um, who's been the driving force behind AFF since the beginning. So anyway, it's 2.03 PM on the East Coast. Um, I think we had a pretty, a pretty juicy hour together. So thank you, everyone. And thank uh, you we all will so much. See you next time. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Have a great thank afternoon. Thank you. Be well. Thanks.